When a woman named Chrissy Atkinson reached out to us in a plea to spread awareness about the murder cold case of her biological mother, she lamented, her whole life was one tragic mess after another. The deeper we dove into this case, the more Chrissy's sorrowful words rang true. What is up, Iwu crew? It was a Wednesday morning on October 4th, 1978, when a telephone company worker in Western Lyon County, Iowa, set out for what they thought would be another mundane day of laying cable in the Rock Rapids area. But they would soon stumble upon a horrific discovery. A woman's lifeless body lying in a grassy ditch on the side of the gravel road. By the state of the body's decomposition, it appeared that it had been out there for months, but the victim's demise didn't seem to be the result of any animal attack. This was homicide. Authorities presume that she was murdered at another location and then dumped in the ditch between June and August of the same year. Evidently, the tall, browning weeds littering the area had kept the body hidden for all that time. And to the dismay of concerned law enforcement, the body was completely unrecognizable. Her lower jaw was missing, and all but two of her teeth were shattered or completely gone. The victim was dressed in light green denim pants with white patent leather boots. She was naked from the waist up, and her feet were tied together with a braided hemp rope. After observing her body positioning, with her arms and hair forward, they deduced that this rope had been used to pull her face down into the ditch, and possibly from a vehicle. The surrounding area was searched for the victim's belongings, or even her missing jaw or teeth, but nothing was found. Although investigators scoured the list of missing people in Iowa and made efforts to check South Dakota as well, nothing came of it. With no leads to follow, police were empty-handed and the case went cold for almost three decades. That is, until January of 2006, when a laboratory technician was finally able to make a breakthrough by matching the unidentified woman's left thumbprint to a print card from the Los Angeles Police Department, collected when she had previously been arrested for prostitution in California. The elusive name of this mystery woman, who authorities had been referring to as Jane Doe for decades, was finally revealed to be Wilma June Nissen. It was also determined that she was only 23 years old at the time of her death. In 2007, the Lyon County Sheriff Blythe Bloomendale spoke about his hopes to gain new information by exhuming Wilma's remains and enlisting the help of a forensic anthropologist. He asserted, Wilma was a human being and deserves to be handled that way, not just in life, but now in death. Wilma deserves an end to this, and I'm going to give that to her. He plastered a paper timeline of Wilma's life on his office wall to serve as a daily reminder of the justice that still demanded to be served. A dislocation of the victim's right elbow and a suggestion of a dislocated cervical vertebrae noted by a medical examiner in 1978 led Bloomendale to believe that Wilma may have put up a fight at the time of her death in which case the DNA of her attacker could have been caught underneath her fingernails. In addition, Wilma's pants and underwear were wrapped around her left leg when her remains were discovered, leading investigators to theorize that a sexual assault could have occurred. Exhuming her remains would allow them to check for important DNA evidence related to both of these theories. However, they knew that because of Wilma's line of work, any DNA found connecting her to a sexual partner wouldn't necessarily lead to her killer. Bloomendale also pushed for DNA testing to be conducted on her clothing and the rope which was used to bind her feet. Her fingernails were even removed from her body and sent out for testing. 
Unfortunately, when Wilma's body was finally unearthed, authorities were dismayed to find that her coffin was filled with water, with some of her bones floating inside. Bloomingdale spoke, DNA is just blown now, and admitted that this disheartening roadblock felt like getting punched in the gut. Chrissy, as Wilma's biological daughter, was allowed to enter the cemetery during this emotional process after traveling overnight to be there. She watched from under an umbrella, taking in the reality that such a promising lead was lost. Efforts were made to siphon water out of the coffin and take samples of the liquid, but ultimately, the exhumed remains authorities had been looking to for answers were little help because the elements had worn away the evidence investigators were hoping to recover. Still, when asked why he has put so much effort into the cold case of a woman who may not have even lived in his county, Bloomingdale simply answered, It's a homicide. It happened in my county. This is my job and I will not drop it. At one point, the FBI was even enlisted to help create a profile of a possible perpetrator. About two years after Wilma's remains were exhumed, the Lyon County authorities took then 82-year-old John Van Gameren into custody. He was charged with six counts of felony perjury. He allegedly lied about arranging strippers for a bachelor party, having prostitutes at his home, and transporting a stripper from Sioux Falls to his house in Iowa. Investigators said he lived within a five-mile radius to where Wilma was found. However, these charges were dismissed in 2010, and he and his attorney reportedly cooperated to some extent with law enforcement. In 2016, even more groundbreaking developments were made and investigators now believe that they have pinned down the culprit who struck all those years ago. But to understand the circumstances of Wilma's untimely death, we must take a look at her turbulent past. Wilma was born in 1954 in San Francisco. Her home life was less than ideal, and by the time she was only eight years old, Wilma's mother had abandoned her and her sister Mona, who was mute and deaf. Her father, Charles, was grossly neglectful, and as a result, the girls had anything but a healthy childhood. They didn't even get the chance to attend school and were locked in a closet all day while Charles worked. Their dysfunctional lifestyle was so severe that Wilma still could not read, write, or eat with a fork at age 10. And when Charles lost his job, the downward spiral only escalated. When the little family was forced to move into a cramped car, Mona was often relegated to stay in the car's trunk while Wilma wandered the streets in a desperate search for food. Their life held little time for innocent childhood joy, love, or laughter. All they knew was survival. In 1964, Wilma and Mona were taken away from their father and placed in the foster care system. Chrissy told us more about this time of Wilma's life, explaining, The first foster family had her a year. They loved her and taught her to read and write and use a fork. I visited them. They showed me home movies, even one of Wilma at Christmas. They were sad to have her leave. But the foster mother had a health problem come up, so they couldn't keep her. They did stay in contact with her, though, till she went missing. Despite her rough upbringing, Wilma's pure personality shone through in these years. With one set of foster parents remembering her as a bubbly child and a quick learner, Wilma's final foster family was Vincent and Alice Haas. Chrissy told us, I was always told that the Haas family raised her, but I found out that she was in a couple of children's homes or facilities. They had her last, but it was only about a year or two from what I understand. By the time Wilma reached her 20s, she began selling her body to scrape by. As the determined young woman hitchhiked to get around, 
she earned the nickname Boots. She is believed to have married a man named Donald Wellington during this time, and later a man named Robert Irvin, with whom she had a daughter named Crystal Joy. Between these two marriages, she also had a child with a man named Michael Pizarro Sr. But it seems that the year of her death, 1978, was one that saw many life changes for Wilma. In February, she left California to move to Atlanta with a man named Charles Inman Belt. Belt later told detectives that Wilma didn't stay long, explaining that she departed from his mother's apartment only a few days after she had arrived. He says he never heard from her again after that. Belt has reportedly been cleared as a suspect. Unfortunately, he is the last confirmed person to have seen Wilma alive, meaning that Wilma's actions from February to the summer of 1978, when she is presumed to have died, are fuzzy at best. At the time of her disappearance, she was working for an escort service in Sioux Falls, South Dakota called Playgirls or Playmates. The children who Wilma gave birth to had since been put into the foster care system. The Haas family, who had fostered Wilma herself, ended up adopting her daughter shortly after her birth, and Crystal, or Chrissy, is the same woman who reached out to us all these years later. Sadly, Chrissy was less than a year old and a country away when her biological mother fell prey to a cold-blooded killer. She shared with us that the Haas family was not very forthcoming with talking about Wilma, and that Chrissy only found out her name by snooping through papers when she was a teenager. When speaking about Wilma, Chrissy says her adopted parents made it sound like she had just left the hospital after giving birth and they never heard from her again. The Haas family is now deceased, and Chrissy says that they sadly passed away before 2006 when Wilma was finally identified. A woman whose son went to school with Chrissy has been helping her search for her mother for 10 years, ever since she found out about her story. She was the one who noticed a published article about the identification of a Jane Doe in Iowa and passed on the vital information to Chrissy, who was soon on the phone with authorities. Everything happened so fast as the reality of her mother, who she had searched endlessly for, came all at once. Chrissy told us a bit about what finding out the shocking truth behind her heritage was like. Um, her last foster family adopted me, and I didn't, they wouldn't talk about her. I just knew that they had her for a while, but I'd been looking for her my whole life. Well, I found out when they'd identified the body. I found out from a friend of mine's mom, found a newspaper article. When this revelation first came to light, Chrissy expressed, I always thought that she had moved on, and now it's like maybe I could have had a relationship with her. It's not like I'll ever know whether or not she would have wanted me in her life, or if it wasn't her thing. Chrissy says that authorities checked her DNA to make sure that she was Wilma's daughter when they first identified the Jane Doe's fingerprint, and sure enough, it was a match. She has been seeking justice for her biological mother's murder ever since that shocking breakthrough in 2006. Although the preliminary DNA testing on the exhumed remains didn't work out, authorities never gave up, and refusing to be deterred by that dead end, they tried a different method. They began speaking to several people who were known partygoers of Lyon County in the summer of 1978. Authorities now reportedly have a clear notion of how and where the crime was committed. But this intriguing information remains confidential and under wraps for now, as they are being careful not to release anything that only the killer would know. What they have said, though, is that Wilma's manner of death was especially vicious. On May 2, 2016, 38 years after Wilma's death, Another breakthrough was made when Lyon County investigators released a photo of their current prime suspect taken in the mid-1970s, who they allege could be involved. 
Lyon County Chief Deputy Jerry Berkey explained, Our suspect was an escort, a prostitute, a dancer, who liked to rob other escorts, prostitutes, and dancers. Law enforcement's hope was to generate new leads with this strategy, and apparently, they have since received at least two tips to investigate. Despite making the image public, investigators refrained from releasing this woman's real name, revealing only that she went by the stage name Sugar. They have explained that their primary goal is for someone to come forward and independently identify her. Apparently, authorities have even made contact with Sugar and interviewed her more than once, but she has yet to admit to any involvement in Wilma's death. Still, Sugar reportedly left the country and fled to Canada not long after Wilma's murder occurred and only returned to America after allegedly being involved in a stabbing. Sugar was a regular at promiscuous adult parties in Sioux Falls and Lyon County, and she was known to rob her contemporaries, a trend which has led investigators to speculate that the motive for Wilma's murder was robbery. Chief Deputy Berkey explained the question process that investigators have been conducting, saying, when we first found out about these parties, we tried to interview everybody we could prove who was at a party. Some people live around here, yet some people don't. He also explained, the people in the western half of our county got very defensive when we first approached them about these parties. What we're trying to get them to realize is, we don't suspect one of you, but we do hope one of you will come forward and say you saw our victim with sugar at one of these parties. Berkey has explained, They didn't see Wilma get killed at this party. They saw something that led up to her being killed, and they just don't realize what they saw. According to KSFY News, a man who hosted several of these parties has been questioned, but has not been very helpful in the investigation. However, the search for anyone who saw Wilma and Sugar together is proving useful and it seems to be the direction where the investigation will continue going forward. Investigators now feel Wilma was likely murdered at a party before being disposed of in the ditch. But interestingly, law enforcement's running theory is that the murder wasn't committed alone. Based on the cause of Wilma's death, authorities believe another prostitute who worked alongside Wilma in Sioux Falls may have also played a part. This escort went by the name Peaches and was known to be Sugar's partner in crime. Though law enforcement has not yet located this woman, they do know a few key details about her. They say she is a light-skinned black female from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Ultimately, investigators believe that Sugar and Peaches worked together to steal the money Wilma had made working these parties. Uh, I have periodically talk to people. The investigator there is, he's retired. They're trying to find, that's one of, one of the people, they're trying to find another one that went by the name of Peaches. And um, she was known to uh, rob, she was, she was a prostitute and she, so was my mother. And um, Peaches and Sugar were known to rob other girls, to rob their clients. Um, possibly stabbed people and because these two women were known to have been robbing prostitutes and their clients all over the place, including Canada. They think she fled to Canada after my mom was killed and then had to flee back. She got in trouble there. It is reported that Wilma June Nissen sometimes used the aliases of Amy Irvin, Amy Belt, Wilma Belt, and Amy Nissen in addition to her married names of Wilma Wellington and Wilma Irvin. There is still a $10,000 reward offered for information leading to an arrest and conviction of Wilma June Nissen's killer or accomplice. The anonymous hotline is 712-472-8334. Chrissy's wish is that her mother's case will not be filed away and forgotten. She is hoping to spread this story like wildfire so that someone, somewhere, who might know something, 
may finally come forward with the information capable of closing this now 43-year-long cold case. She even made the dedicated subreddit r slash Wilma June Nissen to discuss the case. What, what I know I can say, I, I, like I've been going all over the internet and trying to post about it and trying to get the word spread about her case, hoping that someone will see it that knows something. Um, everything that I do know, I, I made a Reddit under her name. But yeah, there's, there's people saying I should uh, start a GoFundMe and hire a private investigator. There's people, I, there's all kinds of things. It was in this online forum that Chrissy shared. I searched for my biological mother for my whole life. But the answer to where she was just brought around more questions. Later pointing out the sad truth about Wilma. She didn't get to grow old. She barely got to grow up. If you know anything that could help bring justice to Wilma June Nissen's death and give Chrissy and all of Wilma's loved ones closure, Please come forward and alert authorities, no matter how small or insignificant you may think your information may be.